Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Thing changed a little bit. Doesn't seem like I'm going to crush that one. It's a great morning. Uh, great to be in the house of the Lord. And get the opportunity to come and worship and, uh, and hear, from the, hear from the Lord directly from him. This is not this computer, but what's in it. Um, it is his word for us. And, um, and this is where we derive our encouragement, where, where we get our hope, um, is through his Holy Spirit, reading his word and receiving the message that he has for us. And um, I'm, I'm just blown away by, by, by the reception, by how you guys have received us, my family and I. And, um, and every time that I get up here and am able to dig into the Word and, and, and teach and preach, I am just grateful because I know where He has um, gotten me out of. And I, I've seen and I've been firsthand witness uh, as to his power and his love and his mercy. And, um, and it, it encourages me to dig deeper and get to know him better because he knows me so well and he loves me. Um, the, the greatest thing about loving someone is knowing them intimately, knowing them full out faults, and everything, and still loving them fully. And that is what the Lord does for us, right? He knows us intimately. The, the things that are hidden back here that maybe we don't speak, or maybe it's, he knows those thoughts, he knows those things, and yet he loves us. Um, I was really encouraged last night. I went to, uh, I went to see um, Jimmy... Uh, McDonald and, and Martha uh, Marco last night at, at the hospital. Uh, Billy called me or sent me a message and, and said, you know, just want to, you know, this is what's going on. And, and we had a little get together for, for my daughter. Uh, and when we got that wrapped up, I took off and I, I told Bethany, pray for me. You know, here we go. Um, I'm still getting to know everybody, and so the whole drive there, I'm, I'm praying, and Lord, um, speak through me. Let me be encouraging. Let me uh, minister, you know, and, and I get there, and both of them are just encouraging me, you know, and, uh, and giving me advice, and, you know, it, we're not going to be there tomorrow, but if, if we could, <laughs> and I'm just like, man, Lord, you minister to us individually in such awesome ways, and I'm blown away by your attention and your love for me. And um, I took a little bit longer with Jimmy. We went past visiting hours, um, but it was great. And um, and we told him we're going to be we're going to be praying for you guys. And the Lord knows what will come out of these situations, and He tells us that for the for those that love Him. Those that love him, every situation he can use for good. Um, and so that's our prayer. Um, will you pray with me this morning before we get started? Lord, we thank you, um, God, for your love and your mercy toward us. How you take care of us, how you provide for us. Lord, on a, on a daily basis, you meet our needs and above and beyond our needs but also, God, for, for eternity with you. Though we were still enemies, though we're, we were at odds, you sent your son Jesus and died on the cross for us to redeem us so that we could be in harmony again and that we could be uh, in communion with you, Lord. We thank you for that. Be with us this morning as we uh, dig into your word, God. Speak to us, minister to us, heal, um, encourage through your Holy Spirit as we dig into your scriptures, God. We love you, Lord. We worship you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So we're still, I hope you don't mind, but this is, I, I love studying the Word. Because I think that going through the Scriptures, as we have been, we get to know what the Scripture actually says, instead of taking a snapshot from here, and another snapshot from there, and combining them, and coming up with all kinds of other messages. So we know and we get to know the context of the Scripture, the, what was going on at the time, and then what is that saying to me? And so I'm, we're still in Peter. If you still have that marked out from last week, we're still in First Peter, and we will finally wrap up the first chapter. Um, we'll be in verses 17 through 25. Peter is, last week, calling us out to be holy. We'll start at verse 13 to review, and then we'll get into uh, to this week's lesson. Therefore, again, we covered everything about security, uh, our eternal home is secure, those that abide with the Lord, you are secure, those that are part of the family, part of the kingdom of God, God has us in, in his hand. We are secure. And after all that, Peter says, therefore. Preparing your minds for action. This takes work. This is work on ourselves. Not, okay, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and go and work on someone. This is work on us. We have to do battle continually on a daily basis with the flesh and Peter is encouraging us to roll up our sleeves and he says preparing your minds for action and being sober minded set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Calling us out on our actions and our conduct, how we behave ourselves. Remember, there is this movie that um, my kids watch on occasion, and you former kids might uh, remember this. It's The Lion King. And, um, and I'll just give you a little snapshot of what's going on. There, there is a fight, a, a family fight between two lions um, trying to be king. And there is a son that the father dies and the uncle takes over, and so the little lion cub is run off into the wilderness. And he's doing all kinds of crazy things with, you know, other animals, making friendships over here and living a life of a non-lion. It's basically the, the story of the prodigal son. And at his furthest away point, he has this vision, this dream, this, his father speaking to him and says, remember who you are. Remember who you belong to. And, and, it's, and it speaks to me because there, there is a redemptive story in, in that. I, I love redeeming stories. Um, and, amen? <laughs> because we're a part of the most important story. We've been adopted into the family of God. And, and so, man, it, it, it hits us right there, right? It... it it speaks to us. And so as we're reading, verse 16 says, Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You are mine. God is saying, remember who you are. Remember who you belong to. Verse 17, And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to, to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. This isn't like, oh, something is going to happen to me. 
if God sees me doing this. It's not that kind of fear. Although he is very capable of doing whatever he wants. It's, it's a fear that is reverent. I don't want to do anything that harms the family. And I don't want to do anything that brings harm to my father and his name. We have a mission, right? We've talked about this in the last few weeks. What is our purpose here? Is to further the kingdom. Go and make disciples. That's the instructions that we got from Jesus. We weren't there, but there was other people there, and then it got passed on to us. Go. Go and make disciples. So as we have that mission in mind, the way that we conduct ourselves should reflect the mission. We're not going to do anything that prevents us from making disciples. I will do anything, remove all obstacles so that I can further the kingdom. So Peter is telling us, you guys in exile, you, what was going on at the time is that the, um, the church, which had been in Israel, was dispersed and had to run, run because of persecution. And so they are away from the origins of the church, out, dispersed away from persecution. And so Peter is telling them, you exiles, you guys that are out there hiding out, still meeting, conduct yourselves in a manner that represents who you belong to. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. If you're going to call him father, represent him well. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. The NIV says your empty ways. And further up um, in last week's section, it says your ignorant ways. Don't go back to doing the same things that you've always done. Where has it brought you? They are empty ways. Inherited from your forefathers. Not with perishable things. How, how was this bought? How was this right bought? Not with a mere silver and gold. That's what Peter's saying. Not with perishable things such as silver and gold. Verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ. like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, bought by the perfect lamb of God, taken on our sin. Man, why do you keep harping on this same message, the same message? We're just simply reading the scripture. And Peter saw fit to be repetitive because we have a tendency to forget we walk out those doors and that world out there dominates all of our senses. Bought by the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. It was known that Jesus would be the one. Before earth was formed, before the waters and the earth and the animals and everything else, before creation, it was known already that Jesus would be the one to take the penalty of sin. And it would also be known that we would fail. Back from Adam and Eve and every failure that I have had, it was known. And it would be necessary for Christ to, to take my punishment because there was no way that I was going to earn that. And you. We're all in this together. (laughs) 
God, sovereign God, knew that we would need Jesus. Wow. Jesus came to earth, born as a baby, willingly, knowing what he would have to go through. He felt every whip. He felt every pain that the soldiers inflicted on him. Knowing that before he was ever born as a baby, as God, he knew this would be necessary and still went through it. Does that impact you? It does me. I, I, I'm just amazed. Because I live my life in a matter that I try to minimize the amount of pain that I go through. And so willingly walking into a situation where I'm going to be hurting, you're on your own. Verse 21, who through him are believers, we are believers in God, who raised him, Jesus, from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. What verse 21 is saying, if, if Jesus remained in the grave, then we, we honestly have no hope. We... we um, we can sing all day long, we can go through the scriptures all day long, but there's no hope. But he is not in the tomb. He was raised from the dead. And, and we can tackle this, this argument by history. We can, we can have, there's actual testimony, over 500 people that saw him walking and talking and teaching after the crucifixion. From secular history, we can figure those things out. But the scripture tells us, and we believe the scriptures, this is the word of God. raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Another thing that verse 21 is saying is don't lay your hopes and your dreams on perishable things. Having purified your souls by your obedience through obedience, we are purified. To the truth, for a sincere brotherly love. Sincere brotherly love. When I was talking to um, Martha last night, well, on, on Tuesday, uh, we met for dinner. We went to Granny Mikey's. And thank you for the invitation, by the way. It was great, delicious. Um, the snake was a, a, a treat for my kids. Um, we were talking on Tuesday how we, it, as a body of believers, we, we should have more fellowship, more community. Uh, and, uh, and so when I was talking to Martha last night, that, and she referred to Tuesday in our conversation, and she says, you know, I, I would love to do that more often, get together, have meals together, do things, activities together. We are a family. And, and so she longs for that. But she said, you know, while I've been here in the hospital, man, the people that have been coming in, it's just been a blessing to her. People coming and loving on her. And that's, that's, how, that's how it should be. As a body of believers, we care for each other. If my mom gets hurt, I'm going to go and see what's going on with my mom. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And 
don't want to get on the soapbox quite yet, but we need to care for each other. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly. I wasn't sure what the word earnestly meant, so I looked it up. There's this thing called Google. And a couple of the synonyms are intensely, intimately, honestly. An antonym is, or the opposite, is mildly, casually. It's a radical thought, right? For a long time, I was a churchgoer, and I loved mildly. Whenever, you know, whenever I had time for it. Whenever it's, it was convenient for me. Peter is radical. He's ridiculously radical. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. That means that our motivations need to be checked. Why are we going to the hospital to check on those that are sick? Out of love. From a pure heart. The motivation needs to be pure. Twenty-three, since you have been born again, not of perishable, there's that word again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Peter's reminding us again, it is secure. For those of us, that are a part of this promise, that have accepted, that have been called. I had a few conversations with Frank, uh, and, um, and he was using that word, call. I like it. And sometimes that, that kind of a word kind of it might mean that we're assuming some things. But there is a call that those that are part of the family of God have listened to. Because he does call. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. 24. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls. It may be beautiful outside in the spring, but come summertime, man, it is not going to be the same. But this is secure. And we can put our faith on that. Verse 25, But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to us. It needs to be proclaimed. It needs to be said. It needs to be shared. Good deeds are just good deeds if we are not claiming the name of Jesus. There, there is a, um, a quote that just kind of didn't sit very well with me about sharing the gospel and 
if necessary, use words. I mean, it kind of sounds right, but we are to claim the gospel. We are to speak it. There is power in speaking it. Otherwise, we're just doing a favor for our neighbor. All conduct, everything that we do, everything that we say is dictated by this message. Sometimes when we read the Bible, there's like this uneasy feeling. Do you all get that ever? Maybe it's just me. Because I deal with the flesh and then the spirit, the rejuvenating spirit of the Lord working in me and working against the flesh. And so when I read the word and the Holy Spirit is working in me, there's this like, the flesh is like, man, no. And so sometimes when I read, I'm like, man, that does not sound right. It's hard to understand and it's a little uneasy. God gets all the credit here. We read before, Peter is saying, he caused it. If you have faith in him, he caused it. There was an awakening, there was an understanding, there was discernment through him working in us, preparing our hearts and our minds to receive the message. Yet, we live it out. He wakes us up. He revives us. We're, we're dead, honestly. That's what it is. As we are dead, and a dead person cannot come to life on his own. When we think about Lazarus and his story, dead for three days, and it wasn't until Jesus came and said, Lazarus, rise up. And so he gets the credit for our life now. We may be sitting here, and, and we can all hear what is coming from the Scripture. But not all are stirred. It's an assumption, I know. It's a generalization, I know. But as a person that sat in a pew for years and years... It did not stir me. And so for those that are moved, for those that are stirred, those people are being called. And Christ is saying, accept what I did for you. Own it. Come be a part of the family. And the promise isn't that things are going to be easier for you. We we know two folks in ICU right now. But there is still hope. There is still hope here. It's not just an eternity. Eternity is a big deal. I am so grateful for that. But it also means that here on earth, there is contentment and there is peace from him. There is comfort. As we struggle, as we strive, as we are living this life, there is this peace. Jesse, I got you. I got you. But, but what am I going to do with... I got you. Sometimes when I, when I talk to my son and, and he's having... He doesn't like to get this kind of attention. And he's struggling through something and he's worried. It makes all the difference in the world for me to just put my arm around him. He still has to figure out math, 
But, you know, just putting my arm around them. And so we still have to deal with this life and with this flesh. But being a part of the kingdom, our Father comes and he says, I got you. There's a, a song that um, I was listening to yesterday and, and I, I, every, every now and then it, it I, um, a good song just does its job. Amen. Oceans today, we have a history with that song and, uh, and I was over there trying to hold back tears and sucking them back up there. Get back there, tear. But we have a, a, a history of that. That is a prayer. If we can... Bruce, do you have the words to that song? To uh, Oceans, the song that was sang a little while ago. If, if not, it's, not, it's okay. But it's basically a prayer. It's saying, God... Take me to places where my feet no longer secure me, that I am in the water and floating in your grace, and you have me. If you sing that song, be careful. It might happen. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown where my feet will fail. I'm just floating around, just going with the current. But we're secure. In the song that, um, that, I, that I was referring to is, uh, the artist is Audrey Assad, I Shall Not Want. And it says, from the love of my own comfort, From the fear of having nothing, from a life of worldly passions, deliver me, O God. Again, we get out there in that world, and all of our senses are impacted by the message out there. From the need to be understood, from the need to be accepted, from the fear of being lonely, deliver me. Oh God. From the fear of serving others. From the fear of death or trial. From the fear of humility. Deliver me. And I shall not want. When we are delivered by him... We are with him, and that is where peace is. That is where comfort is. Where where feet may fail. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the security that you give us, Lord. For the comfort that you bring in the midst of trials, sickness, problems, God, you are there. I pray for those that have not been stirred yet, that have not been called yet. Lord, do a work. Prepare their hearts and minds. Bring conviction, God, not condemnation conviction, Lord, that they would see the hope that is in you and being a part of your family. We love you, Lord. We worship you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You are welcome to come to the altar. You can pray at at your own uh, seat, but I encourage you through the song, pray. Pray. You can sing along, but for a few minutes, just allow the Holy Spirit. There's an opportunity right now. 
I believe God is in this place. I believe his Holy Spirit is in this place. Let him minister to you. God bless you.